like to start them off like that and try to see if I can catch you off before, <laughs> before it starts recording. Amy Gabba here from Amy Gabba and the Almost Famous. So for those who don't know, jump right in. Put the scuba gear on. Jump right in. Uh, who are you? <laughs> who am I? Well, we're a band in, based out of Toronto, Ontario, but uh, we also do a lot of stuff in the States. So I could say we're kind of dually based um, out of California and also out of Toronto. Um, used to say we're a Toronto ska punk band. And now with this new record, I've we've got ska, we've got punk, we've got rock, we've got a little bit of everything on there. So I like to say we're just a genre diverse band that just likes to rock. So that's kind of the best way to describe it. For those who are not aware if you uh th this is like the reincarnation even though she's not dead of monique from say ferris and i actually told you that when i first sent you a message i was like you sound so much like monique who is like the queen of of ska so yeah what was her influence on you or oh. none oh no totally you know what i actually was that last time i was at punk rock bowling i like look over to my left and monique is like in the pool next to me and she's like I like your top and I'm just like oh my god be cool be cool like this is Monique um I just remember like I'll never ever forget that cover of um come on Eileen and just right. being like oh my god this is so much cooler than the original and then obviously getting into Save Ferris and, and I love that real big fish you know collab they did uh she has a girlfriend now oh yeah she killed it on that and I think she still actually performs that song but um, that's kind of just what brought Monique into my life, but she's got like that big voice. She's got, you know, she's not just ska, like she's got that big, powerful, almost Broadway ness to her. And, and that's definitely a huge influence with me. Not like that I'm Broadway or anything, but I like to belt it out and, and kind of, you know, mix genres up like she right. does as well. Have fun yeah. with it. It's definitely, um, you know, like some of the female singers in ska and punk who have the raspy voice. You can tell that you actually take care of your voice when <laughs> well, when, when you're not singing. So that yeah. that's a good thing. You just released a new single, One of My Mistakes, which is excellent. Thank and you. I was trying to get you for an interview, but it was my fault because I wanted to get you before the single released. But it is a great single. And where did you guys come up with that? When did you record it? And why did you release it now? Cool. Okay. So <laughs> when we, we've been working on this record for a long time, right? So it was, it was delayed quite a bit because of COVID. We were supposed to be in the studio April, 2020. We all know what happened right before that. Um, so we had different songs written. And one of my mistakes was one of like the last songs written for the record. And I wrote it with my friend Grayson and we actually wrote the song never in the room together. We were, he lives in Salt Lake city. I live in Toronto and we were like, Hey, we need a few more songs for this record. Let's just keep writing and see what we come up with. And you know, a lot of my songs are kind of like sad love songs or unrequited love or broken hearts. And, and the message of one of my mistakes is kind of like, okay, I don't want to do that anymore. Let's do something different, kind of learning from your mistakes, but also making it positive. So that song's kind of about our friendship, um, about how we're like, Hey, let's not be those, those idiots that are like, Hey, let's fool around and date. And then maybe we hate each other. We never talk again. It's like, we could do something really cool with music and and we just kind of became best friends. And so one of my mistakes is kind of about that, where it's like just doing things a little bit different. And you want to make sure that it's not just another, you know, blip on your radar or, or another, you know, person in your past, but somebody that's a, a big part of your life and, and, and a big influence in it. Um, so, and I just remember when we wrote it and we sent the demo and everyone like Dave Irish and Ryland in California were like, that's the single. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just kind of like an instant thing where it kind of has a little bit of ska and it has a little bit of dance and it's up upbeat and it's positive and it's you know I've seen people tag it referencing it as a positive mental health song for them and I'm like great I love that that does that for you so um yeah we recorded that in May of last year and then we finished up the rest of the songs in December of last year and so they're they're all done the whole record's done it's mastered and we just uh we released that on March 17th and we've got another single coming out April 18th so you didn't miss the opportunity for the singles. There's still more on the way. Well, okay. Well, let, okay. Since I have the next single, give me a pitch for that single. What is it all about? Get, yeah. get us ready for it. It's called Punching Underwater. Um, and I, you know, I, I totally ripped it off from a John Mayer song. I'll admit it. Cause there's this one song he's got where he's like, 
you know, belief is the heaviest armor that makes for the hip or something about, the, anyway, he says it's like punching underwater. You never can hit what you're trying for. And I don't know if you've ever had one of those dreams where you're like trying to like fight someone or you're, you know, trying to defend yourself, but your arms are like spaghetti and you just like, you keep trying, but your, your efforts are futile and you just feel kind of powerless. So um, that's kind of what this song is about. You know, part of it was the the whole, you know, Roe versus Wade thing was when I started writing it being like, oh my God, we just keep fighting this. And like, and then it just comes back and then we, you get this win and then it's like, oh no, here we go again. Right. So that was kind of the inspiration for the song, but it's kind of one big metaphor for the things that you just feel so frustrated by that. You're like, I just feel like I'm fighting this uphill battle and I'm not getting anywhere. Um, and just kind of a way to describe that feeling. So I guess it's a little bit of a, a downer song, not as uplifting as one of my mistakes, but I'm sure everyone can kind of relate to that feeling. Now you mentioned Roe v. Wade here in the States and you being yeah. up in Canada. How did that impact you guys up in Canada and you being a traveling artist? I mean, you uh, with, with what happened here in the States? Well, yeah, I mean, I always, I, a, lot, a bit of my heart just lives in the States. Like I love it. I have so many important friends and, and like family and, people that I really care about who live in Texas and live in these states, even that where this is really, really in Alabama. And so a, a part of it is just like feeling for those people that you love and care about, but also knowing like no one is ever safe. We can't sit here and just be like, oh, it doesn't concern us. We're in Canada. Everything's fine. Like we still have, there's all kinds of shit that was pardon me. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear on here, but like Go stuff that we're dealing with um, you know, that you would, you're like, oh my God, this is Canada. Why is this happening? But like, it can happen anywhere. And, you know, we still have to fight for, for things every day up here, just because we're in Canada doesn't mean that, you know, abortion rights and female healthcare and all that stuff is always going to be available. Um, and it's more just about just everyone, like having people's backs, I think having your family's backs being like, it is not up to you to make decisions about our bodies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can't just have the attitude that if it doesn't affect you directly, that it's not your problem. I think that's where most of the problems start in this world. So, um, it, it still bothers me. Like it, when we released revolution in 2019, it would all, we raised money for Planned Parenthood when all of the discussion kind of started again around that time. Right. Um, so it's always been a hot topic for me and always something that I will not shut up about. So I have, I don't hesitate to tell you where I stand on that topic. Uh, so if you are easily offended or if you're a <laughs> Trump supporter, yeah. Maybe not listen to Amy Gaba. And yeah, I mean, hey, listen to what you want, but I mean, just know that, I, you know, if we have a conversation, I'm not going to play nice. I'm going right. to tell you exactly how I feel. So, you know. Now, you mentioned, uh, and I noticed this when I was listening to your stuff months ago, um, you have a lot of vulnerable stuff with heartache and failed relationships and all that. Um, how, how does it, how vulnerable do you get when you're writing? I mean, does it, are you writing stuff and you're like, okay, this is too much. Um, or do you just like, I don't really care. You know, screw this person who did this to me. How does that it depends go? on the day? It depends on the day. I mean, um, the, part of it is I have to write about things in order to move past them. But mm -hmm. then there's the decision. Do I release this song? Do I put that out there? Right. Um, you know, like there was a song I wrote about um, a miscarriage, like a miscarriage that I suffered in my life. And, um, the, like the going through all of that. And I think I was just like, okay, this record's got enough personal stuff on it. Maybe I'm not ready for that one yet. I just right. wasn't really ready to open up the conversation. But once the song goes on the record, that's me, you know, even though it's scary committing to being like, I'm going to be asked about this song and I have to be prepared to give an honest answer. Because what's the point in writing about it if you're just going to lie with what it's about? You know what I mean? I right. really don't think that that's going to be the right um, way to go about things because what's the point, right? So I, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought here all of a sudden. I, <laughs> but when it comes to like being really, really vulnerable, there is a song called, you know, How Dare You that's on this record. And it's, you know, trigger warning actually about sexual assault. And I was going back and forth a really long time being like, do I want to put this song out there? Because then I'm going to have to answer for it. And I'm going to have to be prepared to ask, answer those questions. So you know, it's scary and it's not fun. And some days I'm like, no, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to go there. And other days I'm like, but then I have an obligation to go there and to talk right. about it as well. An obligation to myself to heal, but also an obligation to other people so that they know that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it never stops being scary and it never stops being hard. But at the same time, I don't think you can ever grow or heal from those experiences if you don't find a, an outlet for it. And as an artist and as a musician, that's, 
what we do. That's how we deal with things. So when I was working with artists at the record labels I worked at over the years, one of the things I would tell them is when you're writing songs and there was, there'd be some artists you would tell them, you act like you haven't lived because everything you're writing is just kind of, kind of hard to understand. Like you don't want to get personal. And, and as an yeah. artist, that's one of the things you got to do is put your heart and soul out there for people and not everything, but I felt like listening to your stuff, like, man, who did you dirty? You know, kind of one of those things. Cause there's a lot of that, but you seem to rebound very nicely from, from that. I think that I like need to talk about it and put it all out there and I'm really intense. But then after that, like people like you, you'll hear like, Oh, who did that? And like, are you okay? And I'm like, right. Oh, five minutes right. later, I was okay. Right. I just needed to get it out there. And once I do that, that's how I put it behind me and move forward. So I'm not, you know, walking around depressed constantly. I mean, I have absolutely. We all do. Um, I don't let it rule my life, but this mm -hmm. is how I kind of acknowledge and release the things that I go through and how I process them. So anybody that you've written a song about an ex lover or whatever, do you ever hear from them afterwards? Being like, oh, what's, yeah. the, oh. what's the crap, Amy? What, what's up my with first, this? My first record, the EP, I wrote that with my ex fiance. We were engaged and we broke up and we literally wrote lies like two days later together. And that's what that song was about. And then soulmates and strangers, right. From being like, you are the most important person in my life. You're my everyday. And now, you know, I was bumping into you at shows and being like, Oh my God, I don't even want to see you right now. And now we're, we're still very good friends, but it took right. a lot to get there. So yeah. And then there's other people that I hope they hear these songs. They're going to know they're about right. them. And I absolutely <laughs> don't talk to them anymore, but here's my open letter to you. You know, like, you know what you did. I don't need to call you out personally. And honestly, this is the best revenge, right? You don't right. need to tell anyone. You don't. It's more like, you know, that I'm yeah. talking to you and that's all that matters. Absolutely. So, so you guys did a, uh, I thought this was kind of cool. You guys did a Kickstarter recently yep. and you crushed your goal. You guys surpassed it big time. I've never been more terrified in my life. Cause I was like, I don't want to do a Kickstarter. Like people are going to laugh or be like, ha ha. Yeah. Right. No chance. Right. Like I just thought we'd get laughed right at the door and you know, it would be ter terribly embarrassing if you know, you raise $10 and your goal is 6,500. Right. Right. So, um, it was a lot of work, but we crushed it and I'm so grateful and just like humbled and blown away by the amount of support and even just the people that shared and like shared regularly and were like, you know, telling their friends about it and, and just like to back a project you haven't even heard yet and to believe in somebody that much to just like be willing to do that for them it's just like it's something i'll never forget like i'm getting all goosebumpy right now just talking about it so. i mean shout out to the amy gaba and the almost <laughs> famous fans i mean what 100 i'm looking at it right now 126 backers and yeah. you guys surpassed your goal by 700 dollars like U us and we actually yeah. surpassed it by more than that but they only give you a week to pay so if your credit card was declined then we didn't actually end up collecting. So we did surpass it by, um, I want like, I almost a thousand dollars. I think we oh, that's awesome. did. And then it, yeah. So what is, what were, uh, for those who missed out, cause you were sleeping on this Kickstarter, what did the, um, <laughs> pledgers get? What do they get from this? There's a lot of merch. Um, and a really cool thing that we did for the merch is, you know, it's really expensive for bands to carry a ton of different styles and varieties. And, you right. know, it's it's hard to tour that way. But one of the advantages of the Kickstarter is that it's a pre-order. Right. So we were able to offer, you know, a feminine fit, like fitted style shirt and also a unisex style. We were able to, to offer tank tops, v-necks, normal like crew neck shirts hoodies and then we had I think six or seven different artwork designs so we were able to just send out a catalog and be like tell us what you want and you're not going to have that luxury at a show because there's absolutely no way I'm going to be able to carry that variety yeah. around with us everywhere right so um that was really neat we're doing special we're getting vinyl for the first time and I don't know about you but <laughs> you know I grew up listening to my dad's records and stealing them and I've got his whole collection in my <laughs> living room and going to the record store on a Saturday used to just be my therapy, you know? So having a record with my name on it, that's going to be on vinyl. And it's just, it's surreal to me. It's, it's crazy that, that we're, it made this full comeback and now I'm getting to, you know, put my songs out, out there. So we're doing a special colored vinyl for the Kickstarter. Um, you got an early bird price on it. That was a lot more, a lot less expensive than it would be probably at a show. Um, we, what else did we do? We're going to do, we did a bunch of cool little rewards. So we're going to do like a live stream and we're going to do a podcast interview with, um, 
Mabel Syndrome, who are very good friends of mine, like a female punk rock collective, and basically go do a deep dive of the album and like tell the stories behind every single song and what kind of, you know, prompted that song to come to life and what the story is behind it. So like an exclusive interview for them that they get to hear. Um, I got like merch CDs down early download. Some people are going to get a copy of the record before anybody else and get to hear it like in a Google drive, like rough <laughs> wave tracks and, you know, on the internet. Um, we've got like, you know, thank yous in liner notes. Some people are getting handwritten lyrics to some of the songs. So all kinds of cool stuff there, but like a big, the merch and the vinyl was like what everybody gravitated towards. I was like, that was what everybody wanted a piece of. Well, when I first discovered you guys, I, I love merch. I love band merch. And I always go to the website before I contact an artist or if they contact me, I always go to their website, see what's going on. And I noticed your merch. I noticed the feminine cut, the unisex cut of the different designs, superior tier merchandise for anybody. Go check it out um, and get one because they, they, you have some really cool designs. So hat tip to who designs your merchandise. Yeah. It's well great. And as a girl too, I will say like men and bands, if you're listening, if you've got cute, like we will give you all our money like give us a cute top that makes our boobs look good or you know makes us feel you know like it's fitted or you know what I mean like the we will buy the crap out of that like when I go to a music festival I will buy band merch of bands I'm not even familiar with because I just like you know I feel like it's going to be something I'm going to want to wear out so you know stop giving us these tenty shirts that we have to wear as pajama shirts and that's the only appropriate way to wear them like we come up with cool ideas we've got heart-shaped sunglasses and like we sell out of those every show. And I, I had no idea people would be so into it because it's cheesy, right? But right. I love the heart-shaped Amy Gabba sunglasses. And every time I, I like, we, we are always out of them. So it's uh get creative with your merch. No, it's very true. I mean, I know, I know a few women, a few females who they don't even like the band, but they're like, oh, it's a cute shirt. Or I like the way I look in it. And I'm like, you don't know who Slayer is? You know, name three songs right yeah then i become all of a sudden <laughs> also i become a punk rock or metal gatekeeper yeah. uh you mentioned festivals and we have a big one coming up with a lot of our mutual friends are going to be there in las yeah. vegas punk rock oh. and music festival well like my favorite i have gone the last the what, last eight that have happened um you know with the exception of the ones that were canceled i've been there and it's just a big family reunion right being based in toronto and tons of friends spread out all over Europe and in the U S that's just like this big meetup where everybody is all together. And it's, it's truly like my happy place. It's the best festival in my opinion to go to. If you I can actually, only go to one, go to that. I actually tell my friends, I'm like, it's like a family reunion to go out there and you'll see friends that you won't see any other time in the year. Yeah. Um, and sometimes walking through the hotel or being backstage or being at a club show, you're like, oh my gosh, dude, you're here. Like, no way. That's you meet awesome. your heroes. Yeah. Like I said, like, you know, Monique in the pool next to me. And then you right. look over and like, you know, Tim Armstrong just hanging out right there. Like, you know, it's it's wild because it's just, you're just, everybody's just a human being and we're all just in it together for because we're all there because we love the same thing. And we're all bonding over this mutual love of music and bands. And, and it's just, it's, I don't know, it's so hard to explain, but I recommend everyone experience at least one in their life, once in their life. It, it will uh, really be a game changer. I went in uh, 2014 with a producer friend of mine, total like scooter driving hipster dude. And he came <laughs> with me and he was so nervous the whole fest. He just like, we were watching Rancid played and the whole time he's like looking over his shoulder and I'm like, no, nah, they're fine, dude. Like, this is family here. And he just didn't know what to do. And then after the three days were over, he was like, they're, they're pretty cool guys. They're, they're everybody's pretty cool at the festival. I'm like, dude, we're all in this together, man. The first year I went, I think I went with a huge group of friends and it was like, this, okay, we all have to be together. And where are you going? Oh, I want to see this band, but you don't. So I have to go where you're going. And now I'm at the point where I've been a punk rock going by myself. I don't mm -hmm. even plan to go. Like, I know I'm going to see people there, but it's, I feel safe enough to just be like, yeah, I'm going to go wander, see who I find. And maybe right. I'll bump into someone. I'll catch up with you later. Like you don't need to have that like security blanket that maybe I would encourage at another festival or even, you know, when I go to Riot Fest, I wouldn't go to that by myself. There's not a chance, right? right. Uh, you yeah. know, Chicago scares me a little bit. No offense, Chicago, but I've almost been mugged there about three times and they used <laughs> to hold it in Humboldt Park, which is apparently quite dangerous. So, um, yeah. but in Vegas, it just, you know, it just feels safe and you, no matter where you are, you know, there's going to be people to take care of you. Um, so it's kind of cool how I've evolved to now being like, oh yeah, I'm just, who are you going with? Myself. 
right. don't meet people there that I know are going to be there. So it's fine. Well, a couple of thoughts uh, uh, on punk rock bowling. One, uh, kudos to you for your bravery of getting into a pool with a bunch of crust punks. Okay. Like that, that you're a brave woman. Um, two, uh, who is, who's your favorite, like the best performance you've seen over your eight years at punk rock bowling? Who is like the one where you're like, I will always remember this. That's so hard. I threw you for a I mean, curve thinking about being in the pool with all the crust punks. Now you can't. An honorable it. mention would be Rancid because I've seen them so many times, but that Rancid, like it was, it was incredible. Um, it, I, I, okay. I got to split it. I got to go between like club shows and actual festival, actual festival. If you can believe it, Devo, like the last time I went was unreal. Josh was, Reese was on drums. Was that three years ago? That was the last punk rock one they had. That was the one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it was September 2021, I want to say. That's right. And, uh, I mean, Josh Reese is one of my favorite drummers in the world, so I could just watch him. But, like, it was so cool. And right. and people, whether you like, like, all ages, just totally into it. Um, it was, it was a vibe. Like it was, it was good. And the men zingers, oh, men zingers. Shoot, God, that's, <laughs> it's hard, but you know what? Monique uh, from Sage Ferris put on an unreal club show uh, when I saw her. And, um, and I mean, Laura Jane Grace is one I'll never forget either. She did an acoustic mm -hmm. thing a few years ago. That was just super rad. Unreal. Hot water music was also like, I, I can't pick, I can't even give you a top five, but they're all, yeah. Like, all of those count. They're all memorable. So for the 2023, this is not a paid sponsorship. It's just, it's <laughs> what you do in the punk world. You talk about Vegas in May and punk yeah. rock. Who are you excited to see this, this year at the festival? Man, I'm just, I'm just putting you on the spot for everything. I know. I, know. <laughs> I am super excited to, oh, how do I even pick? I mean, there's some, there's some Canadian bands on the bill. I think um, like some Stomp Records bands are, are mm -hmm. playing this year, which I'm excited for. Um, but I mean, even just like the interrupters always put on such an unreal show. I'm super excited to see them. Rance is playing again. Like, I just love that. So, cause I know every word to every song and right. to me, like that's, what's just so fun because then you just, you find your friends in the audience and you just like go nuts, just losing it, dancing and singing along to everything. And it's just like, it's, it's a feeling I can't really describe. So I know it seems like such a like cop out kind of answer to right. the bands I've seen so many times before, but like that's what it's all about. That's what brings people together. And, and I'm really excited about that to be honest though, this year, like I'm just excited to see my friends and right. my family <laughs> and all the people I care about because I, we did, we missed last year and, mm -hmm. and I miss them and I can't wait. And the punk rock museum's opening and we're all got tickets to go together. And, and there's some really cool club shows that haven't been announced yet that i'm hearing rumors about that i'm really excited about so everybody should stay tuned for those announcements wink wink nudge nudge can't say anything else but um there's some stuff happening this year that has never happened before and that's what i think i'm the most excited for where i think this year is going to be like and also the first time that i'm going where i have a new record to promote too where i almost like i feel like almost like an artist you know mm -hmm. being like i want to meet people and, and talk about music and be like, oh, like, you know, we have a record coming out in June, like literally two weeks after Punk Rock Bowling was over, our full length album will be out. So that's kind of surreal to me too, you know, to to have something to talk about. So we're going to see you on the streets of Fremont, just hustling, flyers. Just hustling. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Just passing out CDs to strangers and, you know, just when begging they're... people to be like, do you want to listen to my band, man? No. I don't yeah, think just, I take it that far. But. And then have somebody <laughs> film it and then you can put their reactions on TikTok and it's going to be great. That's oh God, I, I, I know. I keep pushing against TikTok, but I think I may have to get an account one of these days and figure out what the heck a reel is. So I'll, I mean, I'll get there. <laughs> the cli a clip from this interview will be on my TikTok. So we were going to, okay. we're going to, we're going to build on that. We're going to, yeah, yeah. You'll okay. get like okay. eight weirdos who will follow you from, <laughs> from my account. Now, when you go, last thing about punk rock bullying and music. Uh, when you go there, a good friend of mine, I don't know if you know Jack from The Punk Historian. I don't know if you know who The Punk Historian um, is. Jack, so. you stay away from her. Uh, <laughs> Jack, call me. Love you, buddy. Okay, so let's get back to you and your music. Um, how'd you get started in music? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> without saying how old I am. 
I grew up in Calgary, Alberta, which is kind of like the Texas of Canada, I guess you would say. Um, like very, very conservative, but like just country music. Like there is like zero to like if you're a punk band in Edmonton or Calgary, all the props to you because it is tough out there. Um, it's not a huge scene, right? So I just kind of fell into country music. I was singing in country bars and cowboy boots when I was when I was young and I think I had a residency at a bar called Bronco Billy's when I was 10 or 11 years old on Tuesday nights. And I would sing until one in the morning. Now, like 10, 11 years old, like, mom, love you. Thank you for letting me do that. But <laughs> holy. Um, so that was a lot of fun. But I, yeah, I sing country tunes, the Calgary Stampedes out there. It's that huge outdoor rodeo type thing. And I was a performer in the, something called the Grandstand Show, which is like to 30,000 people a night. And I was singing these solos in front of 30,000 people and I was just never scared of the stage. So it just kind of like, it was that that got me started in music country. And then, you know, the Calgary Stampede shows. And um, I remember even over COVID, like busting out some of those videos and posting them online and people being like, are you Jennifer Lopez? Like, what is this? <laughs> like, it's, it's a, it's like a Vegas show, right? right. Like fireworks and hundreds of backup dancers is wild. So, you know, scared, the, the stage never really scared me, but it was always, I was always singing other people's songs. You know, I was kind of too scared to write my own stuff. And, and I mean, I would try to write my own music, but it just, it was never good. Right. <laughs> I'll tell you that. It took a really long time to like, be like, okay, I feel like this is good enough to put out. Um, but I think I was always trying to go it alone. So I think when it really changed for me was, you know, I moved to Toronto and started playing, um, in cover bands, I used to play in a, a Green Day cover band with Darren Pfeiffer from Goldfinger and Mikey from Mikey and his Uke, and we're called the Dukies. And then we would play all over, and I thought that was super cool because I was like, oh my god, Darren from Goldfinger. And um, and then we would, you know, we went to LA, we played the Viper Room, and then we started another band called the Gabba Hayes that just covered like Ramones and Joan Jett stuff. I have another band called Amy DC that does ACDC stuff, right? So but eventually you just hit that point where you're like, okay, I'm tired of singing other people's songs and telling other people's stories. So, and kept writing. And I think I just found the right collaborators. That's when it shifted. I found people to write songs with, and you know, I'm a lyrics and melody girl. Like I can come up with a song in my head, but putting those arrangements and all those instruments to it, I, I do a lot better if I have someone who knows what they're doing on that end. So right. I've, I've learned to kind of write and collaborate with different people who bring the, the part to the table that I don't and it ends up just being a perfect puzzle piece so and, it, and anyone who's listening who does, who thinks their songs aren't good enough yet you know it took me 30 years of writing them to finally <laughs> feel like they were good enough so right. don't stop but you know if you feel like it's not getting where you need it to be you just need to find the right partner or the right people to get in a room with and it's unbelievable how you can level up from there you know I remember just listening back being like did I write these songs because I, it doesn't feel like I did. They're too big, like being really proud of it. It's pretty neat. Right. What got you into ska, punk, all of that? I've always liked ska. Um, I don't, can't say I always liked punk, like pop punk, like Green Day. And, you know, but I was always a huge No Doubt fan. I love Say Ferris. I, I knew about a lot of ska bands, but I don't think I knew ska was a genre. Like I right. just, you know, people would remember moving to Toronto and be like, oh yeah, it's a ska band. I was like, what is ska? I was on a road trip with my friend Mikey and he put on Mad Caddies, like the mm -hmm. quality uh, software record and the song Distress. I don't know if you know that one, but it's like, da, 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 da. and it's just like your shoulders just start bopping. I'm like, what is this? And it just, in that moment, I was like, this, this is the music I want to write. So I was always writing like country and blues and just sad shit, you know? Right. And I was like, this is awesome because I don't even know what he's singing about. It doesn't matter. I'm in a great mood just listening to it. And I just like had that aha moment where I was like, I need to explore this further because this feeling that I have right now, I want to put that into music. I want to share that with people. I want people to feel this way when they hear my songs and I hope they do. And I mean, now we're not like heart, like everything ska top to bottom, but we try to keep it light. And even if the topic's kind of a downer, you can still throw some upstrokes in there and, and you know, you're, you're still moving to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's tough when sometimes you're tired and you're like, why did I start a ska band? I don't want to dance to 12 songs. <laughs> like that. Uh, it takes a lot of energy, but I just, uh, there's something about ska that I just, it is like medicine to me. Like it is, it's like an antidepressant. It is, you know, it just picks me up. If I have a really crappy day, I go to my ska playlist and that's the first place that I go. So mm -hmm. I think that's just, you know, I discovered that feeling and I just been chasing it ever since. Who is, uh, who's some artists that you're currently listening to right now? You know, just 
Whether it be Scar or anybody. Anybody. Who are you listening to right now? Give us, give us some, give us some Amy Gaba recommendations for the new jams. Okay. Let's do that. You know what? Let's look right on my in my recents here. So I've been listening to a uh, ton of Paramore lately. I oh, that girl, like there's something about Haley Williams. When I listen to her voice, like I can't do everything she does and that bothers me right so she 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 helps she's my bar like i kind of always try to be Haley williams and you know i'm definitely not there but that's where you know she's my everest um i don't know if you're familiar with a band called dime mannequin have you ever heard of them before no um a girl care failure is just, just crazy talented human being unfortunately she passed away about two weeks ago we mm. just lost her she's a very good friend um so i've been listening to a fuckload of dime mannequin and i'm telling you put on like bad medicine or uh like dead honey candid those three songs like they'll just change she's so bloody talented i've been just like listening to dime mannequin on repeat since we lost care just being like god you're so freaking good decent criminal they've got some new stuff out i've been listening to them at barstool preachers uh I've been in, on a, like a really big, like Maggie Rogers kick and Dave okay. house too. Like something yep. kind of like outside the like punk and ska scene. Um, and I mean, this one may be controversial, say whatever you want, but Miley Cyrus is fucking badass, and I just want to be her. So hey, the new stuff is great by Miley and the new, I actually see, I got friends who are like Paramore stands. Yeah. And they love the old stuff and they're like, they're yeah, kind they of, like they're not really digging the new stuff. And I think the new yeah. Paramore stuff is some of the best stuff they've done in years. It's, it's almost disco, you know, like exactly. I'm to it and I was like, it's got like, there's some Donna Summers vibes in this. And, and like, that's, I think a lot of people they're, you know, what are purists or whatever. And it has to, they got to follow the rules or you only like, or like against me is another band where it's like mm -hmm. old stuff only. No, no, you know, but like, I love seeing that growth or flatliners. People are like, Oh, I love all the old stuff and I hate all the new. Right. Like, why does why do they have to stay the same growing is good and right you know and and why do you have to stay in this pocket forever and keep making the same album over and over and over when you could just listen to the old one like you don't need to keep making the same thing grow to play different genres try different stuff like and so i know on this new record like we've got punk we've got some things that almost sound a little country we've got some pop we've got some hardcore ska we've got you know like people have even said, well, that's like alternative radio or top 40 radio sounding. And it's like, yeah, maybe it is, but I just wanted to write that song. And why can't I write that song? Why do I Absolutely. have to stay within the lines? So, and this way I figure then there's something for everybody, mm -hmm. you know, if you only play to one kind of audience and you're only ever going to be engaging with that pocket, why not try to put a little bit out there for everyone? Because I'm a, I'm a multifaceted layered onion. So why can't everybody else, <laughs> you know, engage in that too? So we're going to get to the album and, and the 2023 plans. But I think the most important question I have for you is what is your favorite Ramones song? Cause that's the greatest band of all time in my eyes is the Ramones. Is. Bonzo so, goes to Bitburg, hands down. Okay. Cause that's my dog's name. Is it? Yeah. My dog's name is Bonzo. Ruby is Ruby <laughs> Soho for Rancid. Um, I don't know if you watched the Mikey and his geek stuff. We did a video of Bonzo goes to Bitburg with the interrupter twins, Chris Cresswell's on it. Um, Gosh, who else? Noodles. Noodles is a part of that one. I, I get them confused because there was a few of them, but still to this day, I get messages from people being like, that video on Mikey's Uke of Bonzo Goes to Bitburg is just like one of my favorite things that's ever been released. And I think it's one of mine too. It's just really right. cool. It's my favorite song. Well, my puppy is named Lemmy for Lemmy, Lemmy Killmeister. So, <laughs> yeah. so we got the album. It's coming out in June. What's the name of it? Uh, Do we have a name yet for the album? Screaming at the Top of My Lungs. What's that for? What? Why? Where do we come up with that? Where do we come? Well, I mean, it's it's basically what the whole record is is just me screaming how I feel at people for uh, forty five minutes. So you're welcome. Um, but I, we've got a song called. I mean, I like to take little Easter eggs from things, and that's how I name things. Like the first record is "The Heart Is Stupid," which was a line from "Fuck You, Cupid." Mm -hmm. Um, so this one, it, there's a song called "How Dare You." And it's, you know, I have to hold my breath because it's hard to breathe while I'm screaming at the top of my lungs. Right. And so that's where the the title of the record came. I just feel like it sums it up. You know, it kind of captures the whole energy and the theme of the record. But uh, it's also from a song as well. There's a little reference in there. Do you have any touring plans yet? We have all the touring plans. Um, <laughs> I, I It's hard. It's really hard to set this stuff up. Like even I was like, hey, we're going to be, you know, 
in Vegas for punk rock bowling anyway for fun and why don't we try to see if we can play some shows in California before that or do but like to have everything line up and have the venues have availability and then the people you want to tour with or your buddies and they're they've got to be available and I think because of COVID kind of putting things on hold for so long that so many people have got they've got the next year already planned out so right. you know foolishly I think I thought we could tour a lot more this year so next year for sure is going to be all touring especially once this record's done like mm-hmm. it's just going to be let's just hit the road um but like I said, we've got some fun stuff hasn't been announced yet that I can't necessarily talk about, but we will be playing quite a few U.S. dates. I would love to get to Nashville and see you. We're trying to set something up in Chicago, we're trying to do a little run with Backyard Superheroes in July because we're all playing the Buffalo Ska Fest in New York there. Um, we have our album release show at the Alma Combo in Toronto, June 24th. That will be announced by the time this interview comes out, so I can say it. Uh, we're going to announce that tomorrow. And I don't know if you know about that venue, but like the Ramones play there, Blondie, Joan Jett. Um, really? They just did like a ten million dollar, or maybe even more than ten million dollar renovation on it. It's like state of the art now. Rolling Stones used to rehearse, I believe, at the Elma Combo before they go out on tour. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what I'm pretty sure I've been told mm-hmm. from reliable sources. So it's it's like a dream bucket list venue to play. So we're really really stoked for that show, and um, you know some fun stuff coming up in the fall that obviously isn't announced yet. But yeah, touring. It's going to be definitely gearing up this year. And then next year, we're just going to hit the road hard. All those vacation days from work are just going to traveling around. And I'd love to get to Europe. I'm I'm going to Europe in May and tried to get some shows set up while I was there. But right. I think it was just, like I said, things were just already booked up by the right. time we were going. So just didn't have enough time to put it together. But we want to get out there and just see everyone and everything that we can. Now the structure of the almost famous, do you have, (laughs) is it a solid lineup or does it rotate from tour to tour or city to city? It kind of, yeah. I mean, all of the above, we like, there's definitely like, I don't know how to say, it's almost like think of it like a football team, right? So you've got your starting lineup and then sometimes, you know, the, the other guys goes, and it's not like starting lineup because they're the, you know, they're better than everybody. It's Mm -hmm. more, I love that I get to play with all my friends so Mm -hmm. I can be like, Hey, Dean can't make this show. Jeremy, you want to come jam with us? And it's so much fun. And you can, you can freely bring some, you know, friends and guests up to play with you. And then you don't have to say no to as many shows either because we're all hardworking musicians and everybody's in like three or four bands. So Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's nice to be able to do more and, you know, just kind of sub in, but we do have like, you know, like Kenny, Dave, Dean, uh, Grayson, they are all like, you know, starting lineup members of this band and, and I wouldn't be where I am without them. Uh, but then we've got others that whenever they're available, I'm like, okay, Paul's free. Let's we definitely got to get him on the show. Or right. when we play in the States, you know, I've got like Ryland played on the record and Aaron and, you know, we've got Chris Growl. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He does like all no effects, like, and fish films, like music videos, Bait Me Bambi. Uh, he's an incredible musician. So he's actually going to be playing one of our shows with us in the States. So you can kind of, when you're, we're over in California on the West side of the state, we've got, I've got friends over there and be like, Hey, let's play a show together. You already know the songs because you played on the record. So let's do some stuff. So kind of have the best of both worlds in uh, different area codes there. So the Canadian version of almost famous, are they all in Toronto or are they spread out throughout? I, well, I wouldn't say Toronto, it's a greater Toronto area. Okay. Yes. All right. um, Cause Toronto is kind of like, I think it's kind of like Los Angeles where it's like, okay, there's the proper city, but then there's all this stuff around it, but there's no break between like you just cross a stoplight and all of a sudden you're in a new city. So it right. does kind of feel like it's people would still call it all Toronto. But, you know, Kenny's based at St. Catharines and, and Dave's in London and Dean and I are in Toronto. And then we got Paul in Waterloo. And, you know, so we are kind of spaced out. We're all within about an hour and a half or two hours of each other, I'd say. So like when you do a date, like say you come to Nashville, would love to see you. Um, do you then I look for Nashville. do you look for people in Nashville or do you pull them from um, Los Angeles? How would you, how do you do that? No, we wouldn't really kind of do that because it's we want to rehearse, right? So we want to make sure that we've got a, a, an ability to kind of get together. And I mean, Grayson's in Salt Lake City. So, but he wrote half of this record with me. So he knows those songs inside and out. We're fine. And right. he's lead guitar, right? So we can rehearse without him. And then it's just awesome when he's there. But we wouldn't really like, if it, we were going to play Nashville, we would take like the Toronto crew and go down there. But oh, okay. if we're going to play California, 
probably, and depending on what everyone's availability is, it's usually like, hey, you guys want to go to California? Oh, you can't? Okay, cool. Then we'll we'll go and we'll see if Ryland and Aaron and and whoever else might, right. Max might be available and kind of see if we can put something together. But so you kind have, of every situation is different. You pretty much carry a lot of this on your shoulders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, All right. It's, it's my second full-time job. I'll tell right. you that. It's, day job finishes and this one begins. That's, that's, it's a lot. And it's, I love it. I wouldn't change it, but some days I have to practice gratitude and remind right. myself I get to do this, you know, cause it can be very overwhelming and stressful for sure. So for those who are like starting off and they think that they're going to get a manager instantly, or they're going to get a record deal instantly. Um, how do you balance everything? Personal life, you have a, you have a day gig and then you got to do you got to do the 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 almost famous thing as well and be pretty much sounds like everything besides songwriter. How do you how I do you write the songs? As you yeah. write them and then yeah, um, I write the songs. I just uh, I I co-write with you, but I've written every song like okay. that I put up. So um, how do you, how do you with, juggle all that? Be prepared to be alone. It can be very lonely. <laughs> um, I I kind of make jokes about it being like oh, yeah, I'm just going to die alone and. You know, but I, but I yeah, like you have to like I don't have space in my life for a full time relationship or mm. you know you know what I mean and and that is it is hard and it is frustrating and then I also can be like hey but then I wouldn't have anything to write about if my love life wasn't a total disaster so right. you know you do you're gonna have to make sacrifices you're not gonna be able to do all the things mm -hmm. and um, it's so it's it's definitely lonely but I think I'm okay I don't mind that I'm I've made my peace with that and I think I'm actually happier that way you know right. so uh especially with the taste in men that i have let me tell you so i uh, well you're a musician of course you have bad taste in men you're, exactly it's right? just musicians have just bad taste in people to date it's you guys are just a glutton for punishment i think it's just that we like subconsciously know we need material to write about and right. so if we're just happy then the songwriting is going to be shit so <laughs> we have we have an obligation to date these hot messes that are like oh do i have a story for you right so, you know people are like you should have a podcast i'm like we're all just write songs about it because that yeah. makes way more sense um but yeah it's it's you gotta hustle you gotta work and i i do not want anyone to reference me sounding like kim kardashian but like you do like you gotta hustle and mm -hmm. and you're gonna get discouraged and you're gonna people are gonna hurt your feelings people are gonna steal from you people are gonna use you to you know like people all have their own intentions and their own agenda and you're you're gonna have to kind of learn from your mistake and that's what I've done like I still have no idea what I'm doing but I make sure that I learn from the mistakes that I make and you know when something happens that's unfortunate I I try not to let that happen again and I try to move on from it and and that's really how you learn no one can tell you how to do it there's no manual there's no rule book it used to be that you needed a label to do this stuff you don't anymore I've yeah. had record deals they've done nothing for mm -hmm. me except take 30% of everything I put out, <laughs> right. you know, uh, don't get into this to make money because even successful musicians that have singles that are just like number one, like they're, you're not making money from Spotify and, and Apple music and all that stuff. So like, I'm just always like, Hey, it'd be really cool if I could break even on this show, you know? So right. that's kind of my attitude, you know, people be like, Oh, you sold all this merch. And like, do you have any idea what it costs just to even get the artwork done for that? Like you right. don't, you're not, you're not making money doing this. So don't do it to make money because you're not going to be successful and you're in it for the wrong reasons. And, you know, trying to quote Jim Carrey, like you can fail at the thing you don't want to do. So why not? Like, it's okay. It's better to fail at the thing you really, really want to stay true to yourself. So don't write songs that you think that the industry wants to hear and are going to be big radio hits. Like write the songs like that you need to write that are real, that are what you want to do and do what you want to do because it's going to hurt a hell of a lot more if it doesn't work out and you were just, you know, faking it or you were, you know, being disingenuous with it, right? Or doing it for the wrong reasons. So you I know, guess my, that's kind of what I'd say. My entire life I've worked all the time. 70 hours a week is nothing for me. Oh, because no, you, nothing. I love what I do, right? I love working with artists. I love being in the industry. And yeah. a couple of years back, I was telling my therapist, he's like, you're going to die working. And I said, I hope so. That would Me be a too. lot of fun. Oh, I can't imagine. Like even COVID, I think I was out of a job for three weeks and I was like, I'm going absolutely insane. I need to get a job. Right. Like I need to be busy. And, you know, even one of my dad always says this to me, he's like, Amy, he's like, that's, he just throws it in. He's like, you know what? If it was me, I'd be going crazy, but you thrive in chaos. This is who you mm -hmm. are. And 
And it's true. I don't, I can't stand still. I'm a shark, right? Like mm-hmm. if I stop swimming, I'm just going to drown. So um, as much as sometimes I get overwhelmed and I'm like, oh, this is so much, or I'm so stressed. It's like, but this is just who we are. Like we thrive in this. Yep. And I think to be successful, like, I don't even want to say successful because it sounds like it's, you know, but in order to exist in this world and to continue to exist and to thrive, mm-hmm. um, you need to be okay with that constant movement and no downtime and no days off and, you know, doing things even when you're too tired or you don't feel like it, you know, but so it's really hard to have that balance and still take care of yourself in the process. I'm bad at that. I burn out. So I need to get better at balancing it all because I'll just like go, go, go until I physically can't go anymore. Right. And I would be better at at juggling. So I got to figure that out. So, so how can people, um, get a hold of you, say hi, Check out your tour dates. Oh, you want me to throw my phone number in here now? No. Yeah. yeah. Um, she, needs, <laughs> she needs couches to sleep on while she's on Eight, tour. Six, seven, five, three, <laughs> oh, um, uh, so we were Amy Gavin, the almost famous on uh, Facebook, on Instagram, our handle is Amy Gabba underscore AF. And if you ever forget that Amy Gabba as fuck or Amy Gabba almost famous, um, our website's amygabba.com. Our band camp is Amy Gabba Almost Famous. We've got song like we always put stuff up on band camp before we release it on streaming platforms as well. So if you ever want to just like download a track and keep it for something else, like we've got it all up on there. Our merch is through Bandcamp. Um yeah. great merch. Um, great YouTube. merch, by the way. Great merch. Buy her yeah. merch. <laughs> well, send me your sizes. I'm gonna have to send you some stuff for the merch plug. So <laughs> we've got some good stuff out there right now. So I'll send you I'll, 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 I'll wear an yeah. Amy Gabba shirt uh, in an interview and that'll be some artists who like you wrote a song about and they hate you. And then that whole interview <laughs> will just go straight to hell. So we should just do it all on purpose. It'll be awesome. No, you know, I haven't written any of these songs about band people you'd be interviewing luckily. So, okay. All right. Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. None of them are. Yeah. There's no bands that you're going to get that you're going to interview with. And you'll be like, that's my ex-girlfriend. And she wrote that record about me. No, no, you're he'll just start. There. He'll just start crying in the interview. Like I miss her so much. It's just took a really that? dark turn. <laughs> Actually, I, that would be kind of funny. I would love to watch that interview. Probably, probably be better, like the best interview I've ever done with views or listens. Like it'll just be some guy like having a mental breakdown over you. <laughs> I can't. I that's can't like get Barbara any... Walters level stuff where you're like, that is the interview to get. That's right? what I'm trying to get. I mean, I need. I need. If you could send me over a list of all your ex boyfriends, I would like to interview them. And then I'll release that before I release this interview so we can have a build well, up. Let's do it. You can play them a song and be like, so after hearing that song, how do you feel knowing this yeah. is about you? Yeah. What are your thoughts about, you. she just called you a piece of crap. What's your thoughts? You know, like, let's go. <laughs> Great. How does it make you feel? <laughs> well, Amy, thanks for uh, being here today. And we'd we'll oh, love to have pleasure. you back after, after the summer when you're doing some dates. We got the new album out. After you give yeah. the exclusive to that other podcast. <laughs> I try. I try. I don't even get the exclusives. All right. Hey, hey, you know what? How, like, I'll give you the exclusive. You want to play Punching Underwater on this interview? We can do that. It's not out yet. It's it's not out till the 18th. So let's do it. Okay. Works for me. It. I need the yeah. exclusives. All right. I'm like yeah. failing hey, here. It's all yours, baby. I will <laughs> send it to you right off of this. And that, that wave file will be in your inbox. So there we go. At the end of this interview, we can leak a track. That'll be fun. I love it. All right. Exclusive. Well, thank you for your time and all the, <laughs> all your links and everything are in the description and uh, awesome. send, be kind when you talk to her. Don't be weird. All right. My audience is kind of weird. So just be normal. <laughs> hey, you know what? Weird is cool. I'm good with weird. I'm very no, weird. Just don't no. be creepy. Just don't be, you can be okay, weird. Don't, just don't be creepy. Yeah. Don't be asking for pictures of feet or anything like you do. Oh with, yeah. No, right? I don't do the foot stuff. Absolutely not. <laughs> Thanks for your time today. My pleasure. It was great meeting you, Matthew. Take care.